Well, last week we started a series in the book of Genesis on the, the Old Testament narrative of Joseph. And Joseph, of course, being what we call the darling child of Jacob. Some of you are the darling child, like I said last week, and you understand that. But Joseph was a, a favorite. And to make matters worse, they took and they created, created a coat for Jacob or Joseph and put, him, put it on him. And every time his brothers saw Joseph, they saw the favored one. And it was not a, a good thing because, of course, we see what happens. They get very jealous, they get envious, and they sell Joseph into slavery for just a few days' wages. And now, Jacob thinks now that he is dead. Joseph is no longer alive. He, that's what he thinks. He's been led to believe that by his sons. But what really happened? So if you have a Bible and you want to open that up, it'll be good. We'll start in... Uh, Genesis 37, and we'll go, we're gonna, and we're going to skip ahead to 39. But the last part of Genesis 37 tells us what happens to Joseph. It says, Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. Joseph is sold from the Ishmaelites now to Egypt, to Potiphar. Potiphar is a captain of the guard. He is a powerful leader. Notably, he'd be in charge of whether or not people die or live. So you can imagine that it creates a little bit of anxiety in Joseph. They're very tough on crime in ancient Egypt. It's, it's, not, like, uh, it's not like some of the things we see in our culture today. It's like off with your head kind of stuff. Okay? That, and so that's how this was done. It was just dealt with, it's done, it's over with, and they move on. So this is, this is who this person is, Potiphar. So we start now in Genesis 39 and verse 1, and we see this. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, brought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. Okay, so another recap of what's been going on. He's been taken to Egypt, a foreign land. I want you to kind of get your bearings on this because he's been taken from a country, a place, a people that he knows, understands, speaks the language, and he's now in a country he doesn't know about any of that. He doesn't know... What they do is know the culture, doesn't know anybody. And if you've ever been in a room where you've walked in and didn't know anybody, you kind of maybe have felt some of that before. That not everybody enjoys that very much. Uh, you, you feel out of place. Like, I, 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 don't, I don't know what's going on. I don't understand what's going on in this place. And so imagine that you're there now, and you're not only are you alone, but you don't speak the language. You don't understand the culture. You don't, and you put in a home of this guy who can decide whether you live or die. It's a scary place to be. Will I ever go home? Perhaps he's thinking. Or he's thinking, what will happen to me? Will I be sold again? This is two times he's been sold already. Will I be sold again? Why is God letting this happen? And maybe that's the bigger question. Maybe there's a question you can relate with as we get into this today. But I want to show you this morning this, that the difference maker in this story for Joseph is what we see in verse 2. And it comes up a few different times. Genesis 39, verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph, and he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. The Lord was with Joseph. Now listen carefully, because this is not a throwaway line in the text. This is not just something they put in there as, as a, just a, a, a words that were thrown in to kind of make the story interesting. No, this is a very important point in the story. The presence of God. The difference maker in the story is the presence of God. The presence of God is the difference in your story as well. Do you believe that? The presence of God makes all the difference in any situation in life. And we're going to explore that a bit here this morning and see the difference it made in Joseph's life and then, of course, how it relates to us. So, first part of this is this. Joseph is a slave, but God is present. Verse 2, second part of that now. He lived in the house of his Egyptian master when his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did. Joseph found favor in his eyes. God blesses Joseph and he blesses Potiphar's house because of Joseph. Notice the direction of this. This is God blessing Joseph and then through Joseph blessing Potiphar, and then later on we see him blessing, of course, Egypt and blessing uh, Israel, ultimately, later in the story. It's a significant point. It has everything to do with God and His presence and His work. 
that the master actually notices that God's hand is on Joseph. He actually notices this. Now pause for a second. Understand this. This is not Minnesota. This is Egypt. Pagan Egypt. In Minnesota, people understand generally who God is, and maybe they've been to a church before. In Egypt, there was no acknowledgement of God. They made their own gods. They worshiped their own gods. And so when it says in verse 3 that his master saw that the Lord was with him, that is significant. Isn't that what the presence of God does for all of us, though? I mean, you could think of people probably in your own life who you look at and you say, man, I see the work of God in their life. I see Jesus in them when they talk to me, when they communicate with me. And I hope there's people here in this building who you look at and say, man, I see, I see Jesus in them. He just pours out of them. We encounter Jesus. God, God is blessing Joseph in a powerful way. And Potiphar wanted to be a recipient of that. He, he saw something and wanted that. He wanted that. And so he, to be so full of, of the love of God and, and have Christ just flow out of us that we bump into people and just he spills out. That's what we want to be about. That's what we want to see happen in our own lives. That everyone can see the presence of God in us. It's like, for example, what makes a worship service meaningful? Is it good music, inspiring sermon with clever jokes and stories and, and all that? Well, no, it's not that at all. I hope those are, I mean, hope those are there, but that's not all of it. Because there's nothing I can say to make this appealing to you. You need the Spirit of the living God to open your eyes, to stir your heart, to draw you in, draw you close. Interesting, Tozer, A.W. Tozer, years ago, said this. He said, in the average church service, the most real thing is the shadowy unreality of everything. The worshiper sits in a state of suspended mentation. A kind of dreamy numbness creeps upon him. He hears words, but they do not register. He cannot relate to anything on his own life level. He is aware of no power, no presence, no spiritual reality. There is simply nothing in his experience corresponding to the things which he heard from the pulpit or sang in the hymns. So what's missing? What's missing? And he goes on to say this. He says, only the Spirit can save us from the numbing unreality of spiritless Christianity. Only the Spirit can show us the Father and the Son. Only the inworking of the Spirit's power can discover to us the solemn majesty and the heart-ravishing mystery of the triune, triune God. We need Him. He is what makes it meaningful. He is what makes a church service meaningful. He's the Spirit working among us. Ironically, though, in our culture, for years, we've seen uh, sort of an awakening of sorts to spiritual things, whether, of course, not Christian spiritual things, but you see movies come out uh, like Hunger Games or, or other ones who just kind of create this, this sense of like this other world and spirituality. And yet, opportunities are in front of us and yet we're, we're very much missing them. Ken Boa in his book, uh, Rewriting Your Broken Story, said it like this. He said, the world is awakening to its spiritual hunger just as the church is putting on its pajamas and drifting off to sleep. Perhaps it isn't the unsaved who are most in need of a spiritual awakening. And I thought, ooh, that hits you right there, doesn't it? It's a call to us to draw near to God through Christ. And what makes anything meaningful is His presence. Anything at all. He is here. We don't have to make Him come. He comes because He wants to come. He wants to be here. We just need to recognize that and, and, and worship Him. We need to pay attention. Now, as a result of our encounter here, God's presence in Joseph's life. Joseph was given power. He was given a place of importance. We see that going forward in verse 4. Joseph found favor, it says, in the eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put in charge of his household and all of that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph the blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. The result of God's presence gives Joseph the ability to call the shots. He's calling the shots. Goes from a slave to this important place in Potiphar's house. And he trusts him with everything. That's the blessing of God. And it's just flowing out of him onto other people. Everybody, every place he goes, he is blessing people because of God's presence in his life. 
And that comes into play later on. But at this point, things are looking pretty good for Joseph. We don't feel too bad for him anymore. We feel pretty good. Like, this worked out all right. But oh, how things change. We might even have made like a meme, you know, like we do today, and make a meme about Joseph and how he overcome adversity and, and he, you know, became important and powerful and all this stuff. And we might have done that if it was today. But things change very quickly. And we see that uh, his life... Things change. He gets adversity. He gets trials. He gets put in a different place. I saw this. Uh, uh, I don't know what was going on there. Joseph. Sorry. And I followed my notes. Joseph is tempted. But God is present. This is the next part of this. Verse 6. Moves on. So he left in Joseph's care everything he had. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now Joseph was well built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. Didn't take long for Potiphar's wife to notice Joseph. He was a young guy, had it all together, or so it seemed, and she lusted after him. In a very blunt and aggressive way, says, Come to bed with me. It's the most forward you could ever be about that. But I want to make this clear what this implies for us. It implies that temptation will come even when God is present. Just because God is present doesn't mean temptation is not going to happen in your life. We, we need to remember that because sometimes we can get ourselves set up for, for problems if we think, oh, I come to Christ and my temptations are gone. Everything is gone. It's going to be perfect and good. And then weakness and then struggle and then sin comes in and we wonder why we've fallen. Temptation doesn't come when we're expecting it. It comes when we're tired and our guard is down. It comes when we're, we're in a weak moment, out of place. Kind of like Joseph in a totally new environment. Maybe his guard is going to be down. We need to resist it. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul writes it like this. He says, So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. So you notice what it says. You will be tempted. But the key is the presence of God in our lives. That we need Him. Verse 8, then it says, He um, refused. With me in charge, He told her, My master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Joseph refused. Refused. Didn't even entertain the thought. Didn't try to unpack it, rationalize it, figure it out. He just said no. Why? Joseph refuses because of the grace of God. It's important we understand this. Because this comes up a fair amount in the church settings. That we excuse our own sin by saying, well, we're only sinners. And what do you expect from a sinner? I'm going to sin. God will understand. But listen, if you think that way, you will fall every single time. If we just live our life at the mercy of the flesh, and whatever comes our way, the urges and the lusts and the desires, the opportunity for temporary pleasures, then we're going to give in over and over and over again. Grace doesn't give us freedom to sin. Grace gives us freedom from sin. Gives us freedom to get away from sin. It's the grace of God that allows us to resist the flesh and to run to Him. The grace of God that affords us the opportunity to refuse like Joseph did in this story. To refuse. See, he understood this was a sin against God. It was again sin against God. And even though he had been put through all these problems, he still said, this is a sin against God and I cannot. I cannot do that. How could I do that? See, we need to ask God to give us that kind of resolve, to that kind of position, to be able to recognize temptation and refuse. We can't do it on our own, and that's the problem, is when we try to, we fail. But understand that you're not just a sinner. You are a child of God, lavishly loved, put on a better path, put on a new path. In Christ, you are able to say no. In fact, it says that right here in Titus chapter 2, verse 11, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Guess who that is? That's Jesus Christ. 
It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Guess what? The flesh is no longer your master. You're bought for a price. And once you bow your knee to the name of Jesus Christ, He is the Lord of your life, not you, not your flesh. And this is something we need to remember every day of our life, every moment. That's that abiding in Christ, constantly abiding in Him, because we're going to just fall if we don't do that. I know, because I, just like you, struggle the same way. And in this story now, temptation doesn't just go away. It continues. He refuses and it continues. Verse 10. And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. She was persistent. But he was resistant. Look at that. That works. He was resisting. He even avoided her advances and her continued advances over and over and over again. But now, of course, we see what happens next. Verse 11. One day he went into the house to attend to his duties and none of the household servants was inside. Uh-oh, right? She caught him by his cloak and said, Come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. So Potiphar's wife makes her final appeal, this time even more aggressive than before. She grabs onto him, gets him alone, sends everybody out on errands or whatever she did and just gets him alone and grabs onto him. And what does he do this time? He runs. Runs away. I mean, let this image kind of sink into our brains a little bit. That, that when temptation came, what did Joseph do? He ran. He wasn't going to be the hero here. He wasn't going to stand there and say, uh, hey, well, well, let me just think about this. Let me just rationalize this a little bit in my mind. No, get out. Run away. Don't sit there and wait. Now, let's think about this in our own lives because we all have things that trip us up at times. Maybe it's business dealings. Are your business dealings honest? Or is it all about making money? Is that more important than integrity? Or how about relationships? Are your relationships wholesome? Are you letting your heart be pulled uh, towards somebody who is not your spouse emotionally? Maybe even not physically, but emotionally. Things like pornography in our day are pervasive and, and widespread, devastating. Just run away. That's what this is saying, right? Run away. There was a video I, I saw, re I seen recently of a, you know, back in the 1950s, before my time, you know, but whatever. But back in the 1950s, there was a, uh, in Nevada, they built these dooms towns, you know, where they, they built these homes and they put up banks and homes and, and all this stuff. And then they dropped a nuclear bomb and watched it explode to try to see what would happen. They put mannequin families in there. In fact, here's a picture of that. Some of them in that. They put these like mannequin families in there and they set them up around the table and then uh, they dropped the bomb and then they watched what happened. It's kind of an interesting thing. Doomstown, it was called. I was thinking about that as I was watching that because, uh, you know, this is in many ways the image we need to have in our mind when it comes to sin. And, and it's amazing footage as these homes are incinerated. But if you knew that that was going to happen, you wouldn't set up and sit around the table and wait for it to happen, would you? That's what sin does to us. It gets us so close to it, and then everything is destroyed. Devastation. So don't set up your life in Doomstown. If you knew that was coming, you'd, you'd leave. And being tempted is a warning. Impending doom, get out. Run away. I think I've made my point there. Okay, we'll move on. Get out. Verse 13. So now she's humiliated. Now she's really mad. She takes her lust and now she throws it at him in another way. When he, she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, she called her household servants. Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has been brought to us to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. She kept his cloak beside her until his master came home. Then she told him the story. That Hebrew slave you brought us came to me to make sport of me, but as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. When his master heard the story, his wife told him, saying, This is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger. And Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. From royalty 
the place of despair all over again. He did the right things, and he went to prison. But again, the difference here is the presence of God. See, Joseph is put into prison for doing the right thing, but God is present. We begin right where we started again, verse 20. Joseph's master, or verse 20, the second part of it. But while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. It makes it very tough to live a godly life when you think that doing the right thing is going to land you in jail. And given, uh, giving in, he may, if he had given in, he maybe would have still been in the house, living a good life. But now he's in jail, doing the right thing. Did not help him at this point, although so it seems. And interestingly enough, this is the second time in just a couple of chapters that he has been, uh, he has been hurt by his own clothing. You know, last time it was his coat they used and they brought it to Jacob and they said, look, he's died. Now his cloak again has gotten him into trouble. It's just interesting that that happened again to him. So what gives? I mean, if you're Joseph, you're like, hey, man, what gives? I mean, I can't get anything right. Nothing's going well. But it illustrates something important for us. Very important for us. And that is that where do we find our reward in life? Where do we find our pleasure and our joy and our satisfaction? It's not tied to circumstance. Because if it was, Joseph would be a complete mess. Because even if God kept you from harm in every way, that's still not a greater reward than Him. He is the greatest reward of your life. Known in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Joseph gave up everything to do the right thing, but God was with him. This is astonishing. This is an unending, uncontainable love that God is showing to Joseph again today. He loves him so much that he's with him. He doesn't just give gifts. He doesn't just give us things. He, he gives us himself. A.B. Simpson, founder of the Christian Missionary Alliance, realized this. He wrote quite a bit about it. He realized that he very often was asking for gifts and asking for things. And what he really needed was Jesus himself. And those things come because Jesus is those things. He is the healer. And he wrote a hymn to that end. And here's, here's not the hymn, but here's some of the words that came before that. He said, I wish to speak to you about Jesus and Jesus only. I often hear people say, I wish I could get a hold of divine healing, but I cannot. Sometimes they say, I've got it. If I ask them, what have you got? The answer is sometimes, I've got the blessing. Or I've got the, the theory. I've got the healing. Or I've got the sanctification. But I thank God to keep up there. But, I, but thank God we have been taught that it is not the blessing, not the healing, not the sanctification. It is not the thing. It is not the it that you want, but it is something better. It is Christ. It is Himself. How often that comes out of His Word. Himself took our infirmities and bore our sickness. Himself bore our sins in His own body on the tree. It is the person of Jesus Christ we want. And that's what we see. Finally, because of him, because of the presence of God, because of his work in his life, Joseph is blessed again as a prisoner this time. We see that in verse 22 at the last part of this chapter. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison and he was made the responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. And so now Joseph is now in charge of the prison. I mean, can you just, just see this like cycle like up and down, up and down, up and down. And now he's in prison and now he's in charge in the prison. It's pretty amazing how God has worked this all out so far. From being traded to being wrongly ac accused to being put in prison to back in control. So what, right? Let's, let's take it and bring it to us. The difference maker in your life and my life is the life and power of Christ. He is the one that we need. He is the, the, the one that we need to put our life in and we need to receive. I need, we need to understand that even if you're in a tough spot today, if you're in a very difficult place, if you're, you're really struggling, maybe you feel like Joseph, like nothing good can happen, just keeps going bad, you need to know that Jesus Christ is present. He doesn't leave you. We sang that already this morning. That he won't leave you. Being a Christian is not living a cushy and easy life all the time. You might do everything right and still end up in a diverse or not, an adverse situation like Joseph was. It doesn't mean he's left you. 
God is with him. God is with you. It makes all the difference to understand and know that. So as we prepare for the communion table here in just a few minutes, we run to Christ. We want to capture that sense of desperation to know him, to understand that we need him, himself, Jesus. We need to take him. Have you ever invited him to be the center of your life, to be the Lord of your life, to be the one you put your hope and faith and trust everything in? you ever taken him as the reward of your life? Where is he challenging you to press in today? So we prepare, we're going to take a moment here in silent and personal confession and reflection before God. It's a daily surrender for us to come before the, the, the Lord and his truth and to say, well, I, I'm, I, I know I sin, and I know I struggle, and I know I have temptations, so help me, God, to walk with you today. He want me to walk with you in your presence today and not to get caught in those traps. So let's take a moment to reflect and then we'll sing a song and we'll come before this time here to receive what he has done for us in this representation of his blood and his body. But let's take a moment just to ask the Lord to speak into our lives. God, I thank you that we're, you're not in any way surprised when we mess up. And even if we fail, your grace is sufficient. And there's forgiveness. And that I know as we gather, as we worship, as we live our lives, we, we want to do the right thing. And so often the wrong thing is right in front of us, calling us, <laughs> compelling us, pulling us in. So, Lord, I I pray this morning that each one of us in this reflection would understand your grace and the freedom you give to us in your grace. Not to sin, but freedom from sin. Freedom to walk away from sin and to embrace Christ. In the difficulties, doing the right thing and even getting all kinds of uh, of flack for it. Lord, we want to be where you want us to be. Help us in our struggles and our trials and our adversity in life to press in and realize that you have not left us there, that you're you're not walking away. Joseph was clearly uh, under your hand and direction all through this, and we'll see it as we go forward even more. Thank you for that. Thank you for your love for us and how you lavish it on us and you didn't wait for us to get it right. You didn't wait for us to fix ourselves. You came and died on the cross. Bore our sins, bore our sickness, bore it all so that we could live eternally with you. So I pray this morning for any in here who has never bowed their knee, that today would be a day of freedom. No longer do you and do we need to be in control of our life because we do a pretty bad job of that. We mess it up all the time. But we can be free by receiving Jesus as our Savior and let him be the one who directs our steps. Lord, lead us in our time of communion that as we gather here, we would reflect and understand what you've done for us, the great cost, and what that means for us today. That we can receive and keep being filled with with Jesus and in your life and your power and your presence. Lord, we need your spirit. We don't want to live a spiritless Christianity. We want to be filled and overflowing. So fill us fresh, we pray. In this time, in Jesus' name, amen.